So in the last section, we talked about data visualization and um, it's in particular about communicating data in visual ways. Um, and the emphasis there was to know your audience and know what story you try to convey. Um, and most of all, not to mislead your audience in any way. And so what we're going to be continuing talking on, about to, uh, this section is a continuation of, of that theme. Um, and uh, we're going to go beyond where Tufti went because he wrote his book in the 80s where primarily he was still thinking about how to present information, visual information by drawing graphs by hand. Um, so nowadays we have computers and so drawing a lot of those figures is a lot more easy. But also, we've created some pitfalls for ourselves. Um, and so what we're going to be talking about right now is, uh, is how to use color maps in a judicious way. Um, and this is one of the most common pitfalls of making scientific figures. Uh, and it's, it's really shocking how easy it is to mislead your audience if you are not using um, color maps in a thoughtful way. So I'll show you um, an easy example. Um, of how this can happen and give you some rules of how to make that decision, okay? So what we're gonna do um, is make up a, a simple data set that we can use to illustrate some of the principles of using color maps. Uh, what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna make up a Gaussian distribution um, just because it's nice to look at and it's nice and simple. We're gonna make a vector of x that goes from negative three to positive three in increments of 0.01. And if we then compute y as e to the negative x squared, let's take a look. By plotting x, y, you will see that we have a nice Gaussian distribution. Okay, This is nice because uh, for our purpose, what we want is a nice smooth function that has a floor and a ceiling. And we know where the ceiling is. So, this is a one. This is a one-dimensional data set, so we're plotting it in a two-dimensional graph. Um, what we really want to do is kind of take this top hat and spin it around, so we get a two-dimensional Gaussian. So I'm going to make one of those, and then uh, I'll show you a couple of tools for visualizing that type of information. So instead of just having x and y, what I'm going to do is make a mesh grid of big X and big Y by calling mesh grid. And then instead of computing y, we are going to compute something called big Z. That's going to be the exponent of big X squared minus big Y squared. Okay? So this is now going to be a two-dimensional data set. Um, and we can visualize it not with plot, but uh, with a number of functions. And the one I'm going to show you right now is the mesh function. So I'll show you what that looks like. Okay? So here is the data set we just created. Here's Z, okay? And we're visualizing is the x-axis and the y-axis, and going up, and also color-coded with color, is y. And uh, we can label that. So we can say x label is x, y label is y, and not surprisingly, Z label labels the third axis for us, which is z. I'm also going to call this uh, little function called axis tight, which kind of makes the axis shrink to the size of the data so we don't get that extra space that we had earlier. So here we go. OK, this is it. This is our little, little traffic cone data set, which is a two-dimensional Gaussian. It has a peak. It has a floor. Um, and if you wanted to kind of spin it around in 3D, there's a uh, button in the GUI here, which is rotate 3D click on it, and it gives you a little tool that we can use to, uh, after the computer finishes thinking about it, turn the figure around. You can see that we can look at, it, look at it from the top, looks like that. We can look at it from the side. We can spin it around to confirm that it is indeed very symmetrical. And we can also look at its underside. So here's the underside of our little traffic cone function that we have here. Okay. So that's what the data is, and you can think of it as a three-dimensional shape. It's kind of a, you can think of it as a landscape. This could be a mountain, it could be a volcano. Um, it could be, um, for example, if you computed the fitness landscape, uh, some evolutionary process or another, you can also visualize it this way. So I'm showing you this three-dimensional view because it's really convenient, but it also obscures some of the function, uh, uh, some of the data because there's always something behind that mountain that you can't quite see. Okay. 
So what I usually prefer to do is instead of uh, making these fancy 3D plots as pretty as they are, this type of information, I think, is, is more clearly conveyed in, in this configuration, where we convey it as an image. Right? So there's the x, there's the y, and the z we don't see as a mountain popping out, but rather just as the color. Okay? So in order to do that in a more straightforward way, what we're going to do is make a new cell um, and use the, uh, use the image as c command so that we can look at z as just a picture. Okay? Make another figure and call the image sc command on z, okay? And we end up with something like the following, okay? So this is exactly the same data, we're just conveying in a different way. Um, and because we are relatively constrained to either a flat screen on our computers or a flat piece of paper, um, this is one of the more effective ways of communicating this data set because, like I said, if you're doing it as a contour plot, there's always something behind the contour plot and it's impossible to see what it is because your viewer can't turn everything around on the page. Now, if you are uh, designing a web page and it's an interactive web page and your viewers really can turn it around, then suddenly that becomes a really good choice. Okay? So, we have an image SC of this data set, which is a two-dimensional Gaussian. It's symmetric. Um, the reason it looks a little oblong right now is because the horizontal axis is longer than the vertical axis. Okay? Um, and so let's see what happens if we plot this exact same thing using different color maps. So the first color map that uh, we're going to use is uh, what used to be the default color map in a lot of different um, plotting software, including MATLAB. Um, and this is a thing called uh, JET. Okay? Here's JET. So the first thing you notice about JET is that there's a lot of contrast, which is partially one of the reasons why a lot of people use it for so long. Okay? But what you see is that if you just squint and look at it, there appears to be ridges in the data that are not actually real. So specifically what I'm referring to is that this cyan ring here stands out quite a bit from both the green on one side and the blue on the other side. Also, there's this ring in yellow here, which seems to stand out in the data. Okay? These are not real features of the data. We just saw the data earlier by looking at the contour plot. It's very smooth. There's no ridges of any kind in the data. And so by using this color map, even though you haven't actually done anything in terms of unethical manipulation of your data, you are unfairly emphasizing certain regions of the data over others by virtue of the color map. Okay? And this is a very common mistake, and it's actually kind of hard to avoid, right? Because the alternative, instead of using some, a color map like JET, is that let's now try using, using a color map that is just grayscale. Okay? So instead of doing this, do us another color map, which is gray. And so you see here, again, we're plotting exactly the same data, right? But in this view, it looks quite different. It doesn't have any rings. Okay? It really is a very smoothly varying data set like we know it really is in reality. And so the gray, data, the, the gray, uh, the gray color map is nice for that reason. Um, it, it really doesn't um, unfairly bias some region of the data over others, which is nice. The downside is that it doesn't have a lot of contrast, so it's hard to see small differences between neighboring values. Um, and it's just kind of boring, right? Like people like looking at colorful graphs and in so much as possible that it doesn't unfairly represent the data, we would like to use a little more color to make the plot more interesting to look at and to emphasize the contrast between the really tall regions and the really short regions, okay? Um, and so the, the new default in MATLAB, and this is also available in a, a lot of other types of software, um, is uh, the Perula color map, which is the first one I actually saw because it is the default. Okay? So here is a, here's that color map. It, it smoothly varies from dark blue being the lowest values and uh, yellow being the highest values. And you can see that it still has a little bit of the problem that we saw in the jet color map in that there still kind of are a few rings in it, but it's nowhere as noticeable or misleading as what we had in the jet data set. 
Um, and so you make compromises, right? This is significantly more interesting to look at than the gray color map. Furthermore, the differences between the peaks and the valleys are a lot more clear, right? That yellow color is really different than the light blue color, which is pretty different than the dark blue color. And so we're able to see small differences between neighboring values more easily, and that's a value in communicating data as well. Uh, there's one last one that I'd like to show you that's one of the defaults, uh, which is the HSV color map. Okay, here we go, HSV. Okay, so the HSV color map uh, has some of the same problems as the jet color map. There's definitely rings in it, but that is not the reason I'm showing you this, data, uh, this color map. The reason this color map is particularly misleading is because it's circular. Its peaks and valleys are exactly the same color. So both the largest values in the middle of our peak and the lowest values on the outsides of the traffic cone are exactly the same shade of red, okay? So this is extremely misleading and especially bad if you are plotting a data set where you have large values and small values right next to each other because this color map makes them look like they're exactly the same, which is extremely misleading. Basically, the only time this is appropriate for use is if you actually have a circular data set, if your data is on a circle, so that as you get past 2 pi, they're actually exactly the same value. It's useful for doing something like that. But if you're trying to convey relative height, it's a really terrible idea because the height up here is one color and the height down here is exactly the same color. So you can't even tell which are the valleys and, uh, and which are the, are the peaks, okay? So those are the built-in colors, the color maps. Um, it's really easy to make your own. Um, so I'll show you how to do that as well. So what we can do um, is, the color map is basically a, uh, a vector, sorry, a, a, a matrix of values, and they are specified in um, RGB just like everything else. Okay? So what a color map is, is a large matrix where the first column is red, second column is green, and the third column is blue. These are all values that go between 0 and 1, inclusive. Okay? And if you give it a value that's outside 0 to 1, it's going to give you an error and say that it, I can't interpret this color map. And so what you can do is specify RGB values as rows and map this onto your data such that here is a smallest value. So instead of O, let's call this the min and call this the max. Okay? So you can create your own color map by just typing in values for these numbers. Okay, so let's say that I'm just gonna make one up, right? So my colors, um, I'm gonna say equals, I'm gonna start with black, okay? So black is everything off, uh, zero, zero, zero. There you go, that's my figure, zero, zero, zero. Okay, and then on the next line, I'm gonna say the next color. So let's say the next color is blue, okay? So zero, zero, one. And then let's say the next color is red, okay? So that's one, zero, zero. And then let's say the next color is yellow, okay? So yellow is red plus green and no blue, okay? So there's my color map. I just made it up. You can make whatever you want. And the more colors you specify, the more rows you specify, the finer the gradations will be within your color map that gets mapped to your data. So we could do the same thing as we did before. We plot the figure. We plot the image SC of our two-dimensional Gaussian, just like before. And instead of um, giving it one of the default color maps, I'm going to say, use the color map that I just made up. And here it is. Here's my color map, okay? It goes from black to blue to red to, to yellow, okay? So I'm showing you this, not because it's a good idea, because obviously I've created monster rings, right? These are artificial regions of the data that really aren't really there because it's a smooth data set. But there are cases where, depending on what you're trying to communicate, this might be a sensible thing to do, right? So maybe you're rounding. Um, if you're rounding, then having these uh, different colors might be a really nice way for you to round. Like, what is the closest gradation, right? From one to four, All right? Chop your data into quartiles, and then the colors will then represent which quartile your data is in. So that would make sense, right? So. All of these different color maps have value and, um, and they have a place depending on what you're trying to communicate. And guess one of the things that I'm trying to convey is that you need to understand what you're conveying and what are the pitfalls of using these individual 
um, these different kinds of color maps to make sure that you're not using one unfairly and unfairly representing your data.